out tonight on a little bit of a chilly evening, nice warm building to be in, and hopefully we'll have some interesting conversation to engage in uh, here on the stage and also involving the members of the audience tonight. This is the second, is my math right on this? Yeah, the second in our series of speaker events for the BPALC series, the 60s at 50. There is another event coming up a little later this month. I'm gonna make a real quick pitch about that one because it's gonna happen really quickly right after we come back from the Thanksgiving break. So there, it's gonna, it'll be up on you too quickly for me to get much in the way of uh, publicity uh, out there uh, if I wait too long. So the, the third talk will be, will feature uh, Professor Mark Moyar, who is a, a historian who's written a good deal on the war in Vietnam during the 1960s and into the 70s. And he'll be here on the 27th of November, which I believe is the Tuesday right after break. That same week, there's, there's, there's a, an ongoing uh, film series featuring films in the 1960s that's accompanying our, our speaker series. So that same week, I believe the day after Professor Moyer is here on the 28th over at the Campus Theater, we'll be showing the film We Were Soldiers, which is uh, one of the, probably one of the lesser known Hollywood films about the, the war in Vietnam. Uh, stars Mel Gibson and tells the story of, actually uh, uh, adapted from the, uh, the story told by one of the soldiers who was present, in fact, one of the commanding, commanding officers who was present at the very first military engagement between uh, American troops and North Vietnamese regular troops in the, during the, the war in Vietnam. So we, we hope that some of you might be able to make it out for uh, the, the next speaker event and, the, and maybe for that film as well. Tonight's event features Professor Mark Bauerlein, who is here in the, appropriately at center stage. Professor Bauerlein is a professor of English at Emory University, and he's also uh, the editor at the, at the journal First Things. He has written a good deal on, I think broadly speaking, we can just say the in the context of our series, the, the cultural consequences and the cultural manifestations in, the contemporary, in a contemporary American society of this period, the 1960s, that we're interested in. Even, I think, frankly, when he's, when he's not talking specifically in that historical framework and he's not making it uh, evident, perhaps, that he's talking about effects of the 60s, I think, nonetheless, at an implicit level, a fair amount of his analysis of what's happening in contemporary America has to do with the, the topic of the series. So we're tremendously happy to have him tonight, and the format is going to be, the, for those of you who are here for the, the first event, and it will be the same format for the remaining events as well, instead of the typical lecture, perhaps one can say this is to some degree in the spirit of the 1960s, rather than the, the top-down format of the lecture, uh, the format is going to be in the, in the form, it's going to be basically question and answer and discussion. So we've prepared a, a rap session. Of, rap session, fair enough. Um, We've prepared a number of questions that we, that we shared with Professor Bauerlein in advance, and we're going we're gonna to work our way through those as, as best we can in the hour or hour and 15 minutes or so that we've set up for that part of the discussion. We have some follow-ups, and so we may, we'll, we'll improv and, and feel things out as we go. And then we'll open it up to, to the audience to see if you have any, anything that you'd like to add to the conversation. Let me also just take a minute to introduce also my, my co-host, uh, who's, who's up here to my right. Sure, I get my correct right my, from my left. Um, this is uh, Aram Lee, who is uh, one of my colleagues over in the, the Bucknell Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and who has very graciously agreed to, to join me for the event here to, to ask some of the questions of uh, Professor Bauerlein. He has a, has a really deep background in a lot of the philosophical and cultural studies sources that Professor Bauerlein is drawing on and is speaking to in his own work. Uh, my name is Alexander Riley, for those who such an introduction at this point. I was here last time, and so I don't want to repeat myself too much. Over the course of a year, I guess you can imagine that you can, you can do some repetition, and some of the same people won't be here, and it'll be new stuff. So I, I'm in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology, and uh, I was one of the organizers in this group of uh, faculty who put together this series that we're, that we're right in the midst of now. So again, thank you very much for coming, and we hope you'll, you'll enjoy it, and we especially hope that you'll stick around and, and ask some questions so that we can really open up the discussion uh, a little later in the program tonight. So, Professor Bauerlein, the, the first question that we've got for you is the following. In your book, 
the dumbest generation, you make a case that significant changes in youth culture, the level of involvement of youth in intellectual affairs, and the attitudes of elders to those changes pose, in your words, grave ramifications for the United States. And they even contribute to, again to, to quote you, to the possible breakdown of the vitality of democracy. Your critics might respond, well, what's the evidence of the harm to the culture and ultimately to the American polity that you describe here? Many of those critics might contend, in fact, you know that they do contend this, that, for example, young people today are smarter, more engaged, more critical, et cetera, than ever before. And so these critics might, might ask, why are you not just an old timer, Professor Bauerlein, who's out of touch with what's really going on in youth culture? And can you, can you summarize your case for us, summarize the data that you think support your stance on this, this set of questions? Sure, sure, and, and that's um, a couple of questions there. One, one about the, the data. Um, actually, first I should say I'm, I'm very glad to be here, and, and I'm, I'm happy to follow, to follow Todd Gitlin. Um, I, I did a, a piece in the New York Times a couple of years ago that was titled, What is the Point of a Professor? And I, I interviewed Todd at the New York Public Library for, he gave, me, he gave me a couple of hours of his time. And we talked about his, his early years in the, in the 60s uh, with, with, the, uh, with, with SDS and what it was like being, um, being a student back then. He, he was a student of David Reisman. Mm -hmm. did, did you talk about that? At, at, we did he, not, no. At, at Harvard. And, one thing Todd said was, and this is the Port Huron days, our early 60s, he actually talked about Kissinger uh, on campus as well, but he, he said, when we were criticizing the university, we never criticized the professors. We regarded the professors as the intellectual center of the university and that it was the professors and the students who were being undermined by, uh, I guess now we would call it the corporatization of the university. They actually believed, he said, in the ivory tower. They said the ivory tower was a great thing for there to be a space in our society where you could have sort of the free ranging exploration of ideas without the pressures of money and politics that was sort of the best preparation for people to enter the world of politics and money and, 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 and social pressures and, and so on. And that it was actually things like the government coming in and doing contracts with universities to develop technology and, and, and scientific work. The government coming in and recruiting people off campus to be involved in intelligence works, uh, things, things like that and the, the, the contracts with the big corporations like Dow Chemical, uh, uh, places like that, that was corrupting the professors and the students and that core, that core relationship. Uh, later on, that was not the argument, right? That, that, that would almost be considered, you know, 10 years later. Uh, on the left, that would be a kind of reactionary argument, the idea that you can cut off politics from, from things, and we can talk about, about that. Um, uh, later, but the, those early years for the student, the student left really before the Vietnam War uh, started started getting getting hot. Um, that was that was his position on things. So when I'm, I'm, I've read Todd's work, and I included uh, a piece by Todd in, in an anthology of, of essays that, that I have in the back there, the Digital Divide collection that he that he gave me. So I'm I'm, I'm happy to follow uh, in in his in his wisdom. Although politically, we're you know we're on, on opposite sides of things. The, the data issue. You know, I started researching the, that Dumbest Generation book uh, in, in the, the, the mid-aughts, you know, 2004, 05, 06, when uh, we started seeing uh, some population surveys and test scores that were showing some, some pretty serious declines in reading habits and reading achievement reading levels uh, in, um, among, among high school seniors and college students. And the numbers on, on those declines have actually continued. The SAT until this year, when there was a tiny, a tiny little bump, although the SAT has 
it's a new SAT. The, the, those scores, I, I'm actually a little skeptical of that, of that increase. But before that, the SAT scores, they've been going down. I mean, the last year, two years ago, they were at their lowest point in 40 years. The SAT added a writing component, an essay component in 2006. Scores every year went down since then, except two years when they were flat. Down, 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 a little flat, down, down, down. To the point last year, the SAT made it optional because you know they're all going to go to the ACT if if uh, if this keeps if this keeps up. The A so it's optional. The ACT does does scoring on on reading uh, and writing, uh, and the they chart college readiness. College readiness, the the number of students, the the rate of students who reach college readiness in that area in the last six years has gone down five or six points. Okay? And it's not because the pool has gotten bigger, the actual pool has actually gotten a little smaller in, in recent years. So the, there, there are reading achievement and writing scores. You can also look at surveys that are done by the Chronicle of Higher Education, surveys of employers uh, talking about writing and communication skills generally of recent college grads. Those, those keep going down. And one of the interesting uh, findings always is that when they ask students, young people, to rate their themselves, they they always rate themselves significantly higher than their college teachers and employers uh, rate them, you know, broadly on on the scale of communication skills. At the same time, the the amount of book reading, the amount of reading hours in general, has has gone down uh, in traditional reading terms. Now, a lot of that is because the, the obvious reason you have no more options now, more media opportunities of uh, video games. TV watching time has not gone down, uh, and you've got a thousand TV channels uh, at, at this point. Uh, you've got you know Instagram and YouTube and, and all these other visual social media that are pulling time from from reading, especially book reading, and that, that is uh, that's just a natural consequence. Of, of the leisure options, the proliferation that we have these days. And the, uh, the, 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 one of the civic consequences of this, this decline in, in book reading, um, and actually magazine and newspaper reading have gone down as well, is that the civic knowledge and historical knowledge uh, remain at abysmal levels. Every time the National Assessment of Educational Progress administers the, that's the, NAEP, the nation's report card, administers the test in U.S. history, and it's the gold standards, the U.S. Department of Ed, uh, in U.S. history, that test, uh, more than half of students, 55 to 60 percent of the test takers score below basic. That's an F. It's the lowest score you can get. Uh, civics does a little better. Uh, only, but, but only, only about uh, less than a third reach proficiency in civics. Now, in a democracy, right, in a democracy, the health of the republic depends upon how informed the citizenry happen to be. Right? I mean, in, in, in a place where the people are sovereign, they need to be informed. Okay? They need to read the newspaper. Okay, this is why the founders put the free press in the First Amendment. They hated journalists. Thomas Jefferson despised journalists. George Washington hated journalists. Abraham Lincoln hated journalists. This is a, you know, a, a cabinet meeting. Lincoln and his cabinet are meeting, and they are debating a policy. This is during the war. And someone says, well, you've got to think about the press. They're so unreliable. And Lincoln says, oh, no, they're very reliable. They lie and they re-lie and they re-lie. They're very reliable, and so you know the rest of the cabinet just look at you know Lincoln making making the jokes. But uh, politicians always hate the press because the press can tell people things about what's going on in the corridors of power, and that's why we need uh, we need a strong free press to do investigation and really report on on what's going on. Well, when you've got low levels of historical and civic knowledge because people don't read enough, and reading still is the primary vehicle of the acquisition of, of knowledge, 
then our, our, civic, uh, our civic condition suffers. So, I mean, in a totalitarian society, you don't need the people to know anything. In a theocracy or an aristocracy or, or, or any other kind of highly stratified uh, society where rights uh, are, are reserved for, for the few, you, you actually don't want the people to know uh, very much. You just want the party line, whatever that may be. And, and so if, if, people, if people don't read, if they don't read history books, if they don't read biographies, if they don't read, read newspapers and, and magazines with civic content, then, then, we're, then we, you'd say this is where we are, right, in, in, 2000, in 2018. And, and so I, I think the, the I, I can give more, more, more data and, and, uh, and reasons uh, for this, but, uh, you know, I'll say in, in my own classes, you know, at Emory, probably r roughly the same sort of student profile as Bucknell students. I find in the last, my own experience, my own narrow, partial uh, experience of things, that the range of reference I can make to students now that I can rely upon most of them to know has, has, has narrowed. Um, I can't rely on, on the students to have read Huck Finn, to have read any Melville in, in their high school years. And the surveys of the high school English curriculum show that there really is no more coherent, you know, I can't, I can't say no coherent, you know, canon of works. I can't mention Frederick Douglass and expect, expect everyone to know who, who I mean. And that, that sort of common inheritance, right, the cultural literacy of, of U.S. history and literary history and cultural history, it, it's simply so fragmented now. Everyone is sort of in their own niche. And, and they grow up this way, and the, the curriculum that they've had in the humanities, in, in all the humanities courses in high school, it's very fragmentary. And, and that leads to fragmentation in the, in the broader, broader society. Aaron? So, I mean, considering your response to this first question, right, you're talking about decreasing rates of reading, um, what is read, all of these things, it seems then that an important thread in a lot of your work then um, regards the role of technology, um, you know, technology for young people today, for example. Like a lot of uh, philosophers, writers, you know, and other scholars, um, ranging from, you know, Adorno to Heidegger, <clears throat> McLuhan to Postman, and even more recently, Nicholas Carr, in the shallows, uh, you seem to be skeptical of the claims commonly made in our culture that technologies liberate. And rather than saying that, you spend significant time indicating how technologies, especially contemporary communicative and media technologies, can push us into a kind of inauthentic experience. Um, and by doing this, it handicaps the very capacities that these technologies purportedly right, allow. Can you situate yourself within this discourse, within this line of criticism? And in your view, is the problem the technologies themselves or the human modes of interacting with these technologies? Well, well we were talking about Heidegger uh, a moment ago, and so I, I share some of Martin Heidegger's, uh, going way back to skepticism, about technology and the way technology disengages experience from, from, from being, uh, makes it sort of, sort of framed and, and artificial, uh, and I run that up through Neil Postman, I agree with Neil Postman, that, uh, that, that uh, the, way, the way media is presented for, for our consumption produces uh, kind of desensitized forms of, of entertainment. Um, I, I remember reading Norman Mailer to go back to the 60s from, from his book, The Armies of the Night, uh, which is about the 1967 march on the Pentagon. He has a little section talking about young people and how, how young people seem so keyed up uh, in 1967, and one thing he points out is saying how disorienting, how fundamentally uh, cognitively dissonant it is for a young person who is really just coming into the world, 17, 16, 17 years old, to watch the news. And the news will present something like body bags being taken off a helicopter, you know, these images from the war 
And then one minute later, you've got some human interest story showing little infants crawling across the floor. And the media, you know, the, the news can present these sort of one after the other. And if you have kind of a solid worldview that is developed and you've, you've got background knowledge and experience, you can kind of absorb those things uh, in, in sequence and compartmentalize them. If you're young, Mailer says, this, this doesn't make sense, right? I mean, they, they, this is the way the world is. And, and the news commentator can just slide from one horrifying thing to one pleasing thing without any seeming serious adjustment here. And it, 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 it doesn't numb them, maybe Postman would say, for Mailer, it didn't numb them, it, it makes them confused and anxious. This is just his, his, his comment. I think there, there's, something, there's something to that, and the, this acceleration taking place of, of things. I, I, we were talking at dinner. I, I, I've now discovered Twitter. I'm about 10 years late. You know, Twitter came out about 2008, 2007. Uh, but you know, Twitter, a friend of mine says, you've got to get on Twitter. This is how you get your platform and how you get your... So I don't even know how to tweet yet. Uh, but this Twitter thing on the phone, I just got an iPhone last year. I, had, I, I tried to stay with the, you know, the flip thing, which was so old, it's cool or something. But I, I have this iPhone and, the, and this Twitter, and my goodness, it's, it's, it's calling to me all the time. Because five minutes, you, you check Twitter, you, know, you, you, you go down and you just, it's so fast. Five minutes later, you can go back to Twitter, and there's a whole new roster of things to, to work through, and it's all very, it's very up to date. And, and it is, I feel the draw. That there is, there is something, uh, one, of the, one of the people at dinner talked about how this really gets back to deep evolutionary uh, things in our, what our hard wiring has developed us to do, to keep in touch with the tribe, right? To keep focused on what is going on with your people, because you, you've got to, if you don't, you don't survive. That's, that's what I feel uh, with, the, with the Twitter thing. It's got to be unhealthy. <laughs> There's this time to reflect, right? You need time to take things in and to process them, especially if there are serious things uh, going on in, in America today. Another thing is that with the media, the way things are, you can be very easily more immersed in something going on 2,000 miles away than something going on two blocks away, right? You can, you, I mean, people call it online communities. Well, this, this, you can find, you know, connections online, but you can be entirely in an online community and not know who your neighbors are these days. I mean, it, it can be, virt everything's virtual, to the point where the concrete, you know, locale, right, becomes sort of a, a form. I mean, you're just you're just there, right? You're not really planted in in a locality. Lewisburg, I'm staying in Lewisburg. I love your town, right? I I, I went running last night all all around the town. A wonderful architecture. It's so nice. I, I'm living in Manhattan for three years. You know, this this to me is is, is it's paradise. Okay, I'm you know it's first night. Uh, I, I know, I know, but um, I'm sure I'm, I'm missing, missing. Every communities have their things, but uh, I think it's wonderful, <laughs> wonderful to uh, to be in a place where you can walk, right? Where if you go down to the bookstore, you're going to bump into people whom you know. I have a friend who teaches at Williams College, and in our, our sons are the same age, so I go visit him in in the summer, and while their sons. You know, our sons go into a room and shut the door. We don't see them for four days. We hear things, you know, it's all media in there. But we'll go down to the downtown in Williams to get coffee. Everyone knows everyone else. I mean, everyone, you, you can't, it's the small town world in which everyone knows everyone else's business, right? That's the bad side, but there's also a good side uh, to that. The, the media environment, it, it's, it's mediated, right? All your contacts, they run through the screen, they run through, the keyboard, and one one wonders if there is the development of of the full range of human interaction, and I, I mean the learning 
of the full range of human interaction. And there was a book several years ago called The Silent Language. The Silent Language. And you know the, you know, know this the book title, yeah. is an, anthropo sort of an anthropological and, and sociological study of communication. And it was really all about how much of communication is hand gestures, posture, right, demeanor, uh, facial expression, your, your space, you know, how, and you're not, there, it is a language, and it's a language that has to be cultivated. It has to, you have to learn this language through interaction. And you know, my own experience, the more students, I make them come into my office for office hours. I, I require it uh, because so many of them come in, they don't know how to, how to speak, how to relate with all those resources of the silent language that go along with it. They don't know that when I see them in class, um, you're telling me things all the time without saying a word. Now when you're online, that's never a factor. You're not, there is no silent language that you offer online. Even when you put yourself on the camera, that's, that's quite a different thing than the real thing, right? It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a virtual presentation of, of your silent language. All these other things are, are either are added or lost to it from actual real contact. So I, I think that um, I, I would point to, point to those things and as, as dangers, as, as things to be skeptical of with young people being too immersed in social media to require actual social skills, right, and, and public speaking skills as, as well. That was only a partial answer to all the things that you said. That's a huge topic. follow up. Or, yeah. Let's, yeah. let's let's nuance that a little bit more by. I'd like to very directly bring that question into contact with the with the 1960s. So, a, a critic, or not necessarily a critic, but just someone who's observing and had had listened to that last question, the response might say, "Well, okay, I accept at least some of what you said as accurate empirically. The 60s can't be blamed unilaterally, though, for having created." maybe for creating some of the technology, but not for creating this particular attitude to the technology, or at least not uniformly creating this, because sure, in the 60s there was some more or less uncritical celebration of technology as liberatory. McLuhan sounds like that quite a lot. There's some other figures in the 60s who speak that language. But some of those folks might say, the 60s also gave birth to the environmental movement, right. which is critical of technology's and, intervention in the natural world and so forth. And, and you know, some of you may know Andrew Keen, K-E-E-N, and he was the founder of TechCrunch, uh, one of the early Silicon Valley public, he's been in Silicon Valley for a long time. He's become a skeptic of the social media, uh, the developments in social media, and in, in one book he wrote, um, he's written several books, the internet is not the answer. Uh, I think this is where this argument, but he says, you know, the, Douglas Rushkoff is another one who argues along the same lines. Uh, Keane says the, the internet culture, right, the digital, the social side of digital culture really has its origins, I said this over, over dinner tonight, has its origins in 1967, the summer of love, San Francisco. And what, what he meant by that is the, uh, the world, one of social media being a place where you can you know, present yourself who you are, right? You can let it all hang out, right? And you can find forms of communal sharing and, and uh, contact with even strangers. Right? And the summer of love was all these people from all over the country coming into San Francisco. Are you going to San Francisco? Be sure to wear There's some flowers in your hair. That, that, that song, that was the anthem of, of the... Of Scott the, McKenzie. Uh, <laughs> of the, of the, of the, and uh, that the internet at first was to be a place where people, right? Where people can form social bonds. It was not a commercial space. You know, it was, it, was, it, was, it was conceived in Reed College dorm rooms, 
right, between hits, okay? That was, the, the, you know, that's how Rushkoff uh, puts it. It was not to make money. It was anti-commercial and it was communal and it was, it was love, right? It was, it, it's the side of the inner says, people who are lonely can find others. Reed Hoffman, who's the founder of LinkedIn, he's one of the Silicon Valley uh, mega, mega zillionaire gods. Reed Hoffman put it once by saying, we're trying to make it, social media, we're trying to make it so you never, ever have to be lonely ever again. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg put uh, Facebook as one of, one of his goals is, we want to make it so you can share everything about yourself all the time. YouTube, you remember YouTube's original motto? It was up there in the top left corner, anyone? What it, what it said in the top left corner? Broadcast yourself. yourself. YouTube was about you, and you are broadcasting yourself to others. It wasn't about, you know, the reasons I, I do YouTube. I go look at old performances. You know, Leonard Bernstein and his youth concerts at Carnegie Hall from, the, from the, the, those great concerts he did in the early 60s. YouTube has great stuff. I bring it into my classes. You know, Jack Kerouac, uh, one, of, one, of the, one of the idols of the pre-60s, right, the beat generation on the road. There is a fantastic clip of Jack Kerouac on the Steve Allen show. Steve Allen was like a Stephen Colbert, the, the Tonight talk show kinds of thing. And Steve Allen is, he, he was a sort of a writer, a, a wit. Um, he played nice little jazz piano. He goes to a piano and he plays some tinkling jazz while Jack Kerouac sits on the other. Have you ever seen this I've clip? I've seen this footage, yeah. I've seen this footage. I, I, I bring it into class when I teach, teach the beat poets. And Kerouac opens a book and he reads from the book while Kerouac, or while, while Alan plays. It's fantastic, yeah. right? And that's on YouTube. They're just missing but, a bongo player, right? That's <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, you can, you can, uh, there, there are other things I bring in, uh, like, like uh, Ferlinghetti reading from autobiography with a jazz band. They're in some smoky San Francisco bar. Uh, and it's, it's great, it's great. But um, YouTube originally was, you're all a star. Everyone's a star. Everyone is somebody, and you can broadcast yourself. That's what you, YouTube was like my space, right? It's my space, and I'm, I'm personalizing myself. That's sort of that 60s individualism. And at the same time, you have communal, communalism. Uh, and, and so, what Rushkoff and Keen say is that's been completely corrupted by money. I mean, they, they never envisioned something like the concentration of wealth in five people, right? In, 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 in these mega, mega, mega millionaires. That was never what, what the internet, for, for these internet idealists, uh, was, was about and selling things uh, over the internet. Way, way too commercial here. Can I push a little oh, oh but, but I was going to say, um, the, the generation, you, you brought up, you know, you're, you're, just, you're just an old grouch, right? Yeah. Get off my lawn. Well, my, my, my response to that is, it's the job of elders to be that, right? We're supposed right. to be critical of the young. That's what, that, that, that's, I mean, I wish, believe me, I, I, I grew up in a household with a lot, a lot, of, a lot of insanity, uh, frankly, and... Had, had very little guidance. Boy, do I wish when I was 18 that I had you know, an elder saying, straighten up, you idiot. Uh, I didn't, I didn't. Um, but this is, a, a healthy society always has some tension between older generation and younger generation. It is the job of the older generation to say, you don't know anything. You know, you, you don't know what happened 20, 30 years ago. You're, you're all caught up in stupid things. You need to learn. It's the job of the younger generation to say, well, you don't really know what's going on now. You're too stuck in a groove of, of this and that, and things are changing. That, that is a fruitful, critical interplay between the two generations. And I, I've never understood why uh, criticizing 
young people, I mean, in my classes, I criticize the students a lot. I say, you listen to stupid music, you blah, blah, blah. And, but, but I do that. You have to impart that not as, you're stupid, I'm out of here. You have to impart that as an engagement. And you have to listen to the students when they say, what do you know? You know, you're, you're 59 years old. You, that's good. I, I, get, I get emails. Um, uh, I, I've, I've gotten some emails I can't, I can't repeat in, in, you know, just, well, you can imagine. But the, uh, a lot of emails from young people saying, you know, we were assigned your book in high school, and I think you got this wrong on this, but blah, blah, blah. it's very good when I, when I say, you got me on that one. Okay, I'm going to give you that point. I overstated that. that that's ideal, right? And that, that, that's, that's, that's good teaching. You want to be an elder who, uh, who, who occasionally rebukes and chides and berates and then have, have the young people come back and get you, right? Catch you on, on something and you have to admit, all right, that's, that's what the, that's what the, the healthy generational passing on uh, happens. Now one thing the 60s did was, right, give us a youth movement. Right? We got a youth movement. Don't trust anyone over 30. Right? That's why I have this joke title in the Dumbest Generation book, Don't Trust Anyone Under 30. Right? I had, I had this, this 24-year-old reporter for USA Today interview me, and she said, do you really think you can't trust anyone under 30? I said, it's a joke. There was this slogan back in 1965, and so I had to, to, to tell her that, that, that it was you know, just, just a, a turn. Uh, on, on that. Um, but many, there's a chapter in this Dumbest Generation book called The Betrayal of the Mentors. The Betrayal of the Mentors. My generation, a little older, uh, my generation, you know, the, the, the early, maybe the, the 60s generation grew up and they had defined themselves against people over 30. You have screwed it up. You have given us Vietnam. You have maintained inequalities. And we boomers, we're fixing it, right? You got it wrong, we're getting it right. Well, they identified themselves in that way, and then they got older, which is what happens. But they did not feel comfortable assuming the authority of an elder. Tom Hayden was never going to be comfortable in that elder role exerting authority, that, that kind of parental mentoring uh, authority over, over the young. I mean, in that famous, did Todd talk about that meeting between Tom Hayden and his group, the new left and the old left? of Irving Howe, symbolized by Irving Howe. He describes Tom, it in his book, The 60s, yeah, but he didn't talk okay. about it while he, while he was here. Well, Tom Hayden said in this documentary, he said, I, I listened to Irving Howe and he reminded me frighteningly of my father, uh. right? That, that, that's how Hayden put it. Hayden never, and, and the others, you don't want to be in that position of being an authoritarian father. Now, I think authoritarian is bad, right? Authoritarian is bad because that's a situation where you're not willing to accept, I'm wrong. You've shown me I'm wrong, young person, and I admit it. An authoritarian doesn't do that, right? So it's not authority, but that he didn't, many, many of that generation being identified with the youth movement did not feel comfortable assuming the natural authority of an older generation, which becomes judgmental. Right, of, of the younger generation. And so when I've given lectures on, on this book, and a curious thing happens, it's against technology, against social media, the tech, I have never had a technology person get up and dispute what I say. Never had an engineer say, you got it all wrong. 
That's never happened. I mean, it could, I could be wrong about the technology. I'm, not, I'm no expert on that, but it hasn't happened. The people who object are the humanities and the educator, education people, because I think they aren't uncomfortable with the anti-technology side. They're uncomfortable with you criticizing young people for their leisure choices. Who are you to criticize them? And I take that as a legacy of this adjustment in, in generational understandings from the 60s. It was when we got the generation gap, right? That's what, that's what the term for it. There's a generation, there's always been a generation gap, but what they meant was there's a fundamental cultural, historical gap between old and young where we're just not talking the same language, right? We, we, we are just a totally different framework of, of things. And we don't want to be like you. So we have one of, the, one of the anthems, the Who song, right? Talking about my generation. Uh, hope I die before I get old. Remember that? They're all still alive, except for Keith Moon, actually. Um, John, uh, John Entwistle died recently. Oh, did he? Too. Yeah. Okay. That, I, I went and saw them when I was 16 at the, at the, at the Capitol Center in, in D.C. It was a great concert, actually. Pete Townsend, you know, all right, okay. Keith was the only one who lived up to the motto of dying before he got old. And okay. was in his okay. 60s or so. I think. Yeah, yeah. So the, the uh, alteration in the way, um, the way, uh, Older authorities relate to the young, and I'll, I'm sorry for, for going on uh, too much at length, but compare two things, okay? How many of you seen the film Animal House? Animal House? I mean, everyone saw Animal House when I was in college. It was a big, well, the dean in Animal House, Dean Wormer, who's now one of my heroes, uh, he is just, we're gonna stamp out these fraternity. We're gonna, we're gonna nail, they're on double secret probation. <laughs> Actually, he says at one point, and he just insults them, okay. Then there was a Simpsons episode, The Simpsons, when Homer goes back to college. And this is, the, this is like the late 90s, early aughts when this episode was. And Homer thinks college is about pranks and you know, doing, doing, uh, doing tricks and, and, and skipping class and everything. And all these students, they're such good achievers, right? They're so proper and he's getting frustrated and he, he does some bad things. And the dean calls him in, and Homer says, you're not going to tell me. And the dean, he's got a ponytail, he's wearing a Hawaiian shirt. He says, Homer, Homer, what is the matter here? I mean, how are we failing you here, Homer? Okay, that, that, that inversion is, is, I think, what uh, is a, uh, it's a funny episode. Um, anyway. So, so this, is, this is one of the advantages of having the, shared the questions in advance that you are, you've already gone into the territory that I was hoping to push us toward with that, with that initial question. Can we, do you want to massage the betrayal of the mentors a little bit? And, uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I mean, the betrayal of the mentors, I think, is a, is a fascinating chapter in that. And to have you just elaborate a bit, uh, a bit more on the betrayal of the mentors, um, in it, there's, a, there's one student, I think there was an art student in that, in that chapter, where he talks about not wanting to learn Picasso, uh, not wanting to do any of that, that he is just who he is. He doesn't need to learn the masters. Um, very much like that, in today's culture, we also see that, right? I mean, youth today talk again, right, wholly, and very earnestly about how the internet is gonna change the world, and how they're gonna do this, and they're gonna do that, right? So to what degree is there a difference between the young people then and the young people now? I mean, is this really a new thing, this young people wanting to change the world? No, no, I think, I think that uh, certainly in, in you know, bourgeois societies, uh, in, in you know, for, for you know, 100, 150 years, there has been a, an occasional utopianism among the young, right? Because they see progress happening in, in their lives. When you didn't see much progress, that, that wasn't gonna, that wasn't gonna happen to, to the young. But you see technog technological changes, you see political liberalization uh, taking place. So young people grow up and they see this process and they, they think we are the next step in, in making things better. It also gives them a, a sense of the past as filled with error, right? as, as filled with the kinds of human sins that we have corrected. 
and that we have overcome. And, the, and in some cases that, that's true, but it extends too far in the, uh, in the materials that you quoted from. Uh, this was a, a couple of arts projects uh, that um, I had investigated, and they made a film about training young people to be artists. And these are kids who were, uh, you know, urban kids who were on the edge. They'd gotten in trouble before. They weren't doing well in high school. They were sort of pulled away, brought into these arts mentoring programs, and they kind of found themselves. They, they became more productive, and they were able to channel that youth aggression or, or waywardness into more creative and constructive forms. But they interviewed some of the kids, and one of the things that, that struck me was the way in which they declared their art really as theirs, and their art training as a means of self-expression and their own originality. And the, to get to that originality, they did not want, and they said this on the video, I don't want to study Picasso. I don't, I don't want to do that old stuff. I'm me. I want to be myself. And that dismissal, right, of the genius of the past, right, that cutting yourself off from tradition, I think that's a terrible loss. I mean, you're, you're, you're starting like, you know, with your own life. But you've got a whole legacy of art to learn from and to borrow from and to reshape. Okay? And that tradition is something that you can take as an inspiration. It's not a suppression of yourself. It, it should be understood as something that can enhance your originality. Right? These are the materials of genius that you must respect and reject, if so, after having worked your way, worked your way through them. And that to, to, to imbibe the idea of so much of, of the present, presentism, centered on yourself, uh, I actually don't think that, that this, is, this is the way in which uh, a culture and the arts and literature uh, thrive. Do you, do you think it's fair to say that the, maybe this, this thing that we're talking about, uh, what we might call generational narcissism, you know, that, a, that a young generation really, for reasons that just might have to do with their youth and their inexperience, they think we're the most important thing in existence at the, at the time. Right. This is maybe something that isn't, it's not specifically, or it's, or it's not solely attributable to young people today. And you can expect some amount of it from generation to generation. Right. Certainly my generation when we were younger, we had a little bit of this, I think, as well. It's natural. The real problem, yeah, right. it's natural. And, and the problem that, again, emerges from the 60s, I think you can, you can get this from the argument of the dumbest generation from some other things that you've written on this. The problem is really the betrayal of the mentors. It's not, that, it's not that young people have an outsized view of themselves. It's that beginning in the 60s, we started producing, I mean, eventually the kids in the 60s became the faculty in the universities. And they became right. the people who were, as you said, they were the folks who were running the institutions. When they couldn't find it in themselves to exert authority and to be the corrective for some of that generational narcissism, that's where the machine really goes out of, out of kilter, if you right. will. We have to have a dialectic, right? We have to have a dialectic of present and past. We have to have a dialectic of young and old. And again, it, it should be, there should be tension, right? And it should be a fruitful tension as well. The worst thing that can happen is for the, the elders just to say, oh, these dumb kids, I'm out of here. And for the young, to, to ignore the mentors. I mean, one thing that stands out with Todd and the, the SDS kids, uh, they're 24 uh, at the time, they were obsessed with the older generation. They could not stop talking about the 40 and 50 year olds. They couldn't stop talking about the, the people 
who were, who were in LG, LBJ's government, I mean, they were, they were absorbed in the, the, uh, the errors. They were critical, but they were intensely interested in, in, what the, in what the big figures of the previous generation were all about. Tom Hayden had written, uh, he'd written uh, his master's thesis on C. Wright Mills, the, the sociologist. Todd, obviously, very smart, well-read guy. In fact, Todd says in, in, in uh, uh, Years of Hope, he says, we understood ourselves in a tradition of, of Emerson and Thoreau, who were the big social critics of their day. And they were a pain to the, to the elders. I mean, Emerson goes to the Harvard Divinity School, and he gives an address to the graduating class. It was, it was 1842. Uh, he gives an address to the graduating class of the Harvard Divinity School, and what he does in that address is deny the exclusive divinity of Christ. All right? Absolutely heretical statement to these graduates. And you can imagine the faculty there at the Harvard Divinity School, where the heck did we get this guy? And they banned him from the grounds of Harvard Divinity School for years. He was not allowed ever to come back. That's who Todd uh, saw himself. And he said the others, we were, we, were, we were very much identified with that sort of tradition of you know, strong gadfly social critics. Okay? The, they had, that, that, that was a good critical attitude toward the world of the elders. And the Port Huron statement is precisely that. It's a very thoughtful examination of the, the world that they have given us, especially in the university. Um, but somehow the, the next generation, and this often happens, the first generation of radicals and revolutionaries, they're really in a, a, a tense, ideological, political, psychological battle with the elders. Their, their generation are not. The, 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 next, the next generation, the, 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 second, you know, the second cohort is not so much involved with, with these, especially if, they're, if that generation, if their first younger generation won, right? If they won, then their followers, why do I need to read the old stuff? Why do I need to engage with them? And I've seen this in, in literary studies. You know, you have literary theories and come, come along every, uh, every, every few years. And the first generation of literary theorists are criticizing the old guard. And that's one of the things that made them good. That's what made their books worth reading. Their disciples are not criticizing the old, old guard. They're just reiterating the theories of, of the, their masters, right? The immediate previous generation. And, and frequently they said, they're saying, get rid of the tradition, right? They're saying, don't bother with the tradition. Why it's, bother, it's you know? Time. They, were, they right. were discredited. So right. for, for, forget about them. And, and, and also, the, the internet fosters that self-elevation. Right? I mean, you, you've, got your, you've got your own Facebook page, you have your friends, you've got your Twitter page, you've got, you, you make your YouTube videos of yourself. Right? I mean, it's, 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 this, is, this was precisely the goal of the Silicon Valley masters. They, they talk about this. How do we hook people on, on our products and keep them there? Well, one, we make it a whole lot about themselves. That's, that's, that, that's, that, that's that fix that, that they get. And we, you mentioned a minute ago that the, you, you, you touched on the topic of how in educational institutions this betrayal of the mentors plays itself out. I wonder if we might talk just a bit about how, some of, the, some of the, those practical ways in which you see that working. I know one of the things that I, it's one of my pet peeves, frankly, if you will, with respect to a lot of how we talk about pedagogy in the contemporary world. There's, there's always some new invention of some new miraculous pedagogical technique that we all have to try. I, they're I th all, I think they're the, all decentering the professor and they're all... Nobody wants to be old-fashioned. Nobody wants to lecture. Nobody wants to actually be an authority in the room. 
and, and I think that's really, there's, there's Sage a on clear the line there, right, a the clear line there to that 60s tradition. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about how, what, what you think about that and how, what the situation is there with respect to the educational institutions? Education, not just at universities and colleges, but more broadly in well, the country. Well, you know, what, what, are the, uh, what are the key words, right, in, in, in education? Collaborative learning, mm -hmm. right? We don't want to, you know, frequently we have reports coming out about how the lecture model is not an effective mode of learning. Uh, we, uh, we have these, you know, the metaphors of, of uh, you know, we don't want, I mentioned the sage on the stage. No. Don't be that. We want the guide on the side, right? <laughs> and I, I, actually I heard this one with the computers, you know, everyone has the laptops open. The teacher is now the peer in the rear. You stand at the back of the room and you, you just look and see if people are on, but you're the peer, right? Uh, uh, but, but, you know, it's a nice, nice uh, little, you know, little formula uh, there. And I think it comes back to the authority of the teacher. I have been in, in academic meetings where we're talking about things like a reading list. And people have said, well, who are we to say what, what people should read? I mean, I, I was in, uh, I was doing some standards work for, for uh, uh, something related to Common Core. And uh, when we talked about a reading list, I mean, I was, you know, I and one other person out of 20 were pushing for a recommended reading list for English. And boy, 20, this got people really upset. The other people in the room, they were, they, they, the only thing they had conviction about was that no one's going to say what everyone should read. No one's going to say that. That is wrong uh, to do. And I think it, it comes back to this, this loss of confidence in your own authority. Right? Who are we to say uh, what, what everyone should read? Now, in the sciences, you don't have this, right? Because there are certain necessary things. That, that you know have to do in science, and you can't proceed on to you know trigonometry or calculus, whatever, if you have new algebra, algebra two, and and so on. In in the humanities, there is there's no sense of that kind of foundations building up to things because that involves making choices of quality and importance and choosing certain lineages and and. People, people are very uncomfortable about, about doing that, and that's new. I, I, I went recently back, I was at Stanford, and I was looking at old catalogs from the 1950s, and I was struck by the requirements and how, 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 much, the, uh, how much language in the general ed requirements displayed confidence in precisely all Stanford students should study this and this and this. That's, that's I, I think the 60s took, took, took that away, and I think that, that uh, uh, the war uh, took a lot of American patrimony, to, uh, undermined an American patrimony, the, the, the anti-war movement, and other things uh, as well, but that is the prime, prime movement. So, you know, we used to talk about the great American novel. And there was a there was a an inheritance of the great American novel that, that, that's gone. Mm. That's gone. Let's maybe do one more question. I think yeah. I, I'll leave it up and to you. But I, maybe maybe Socrates would be a good way. Yeah, to, I mean, why don't you go? always it? a good way. To, no, I'll let I'll let you uh -oh. I'll let you read it. Um, well, all right. And you can augment as you as you see fit. Well, it's kind of a more of a direct question. I mean, one of the questions that we were thinking about both of us is that, and I just kind of wanted to go off the betrayal of the mentors idea, kind of switch focus from, you know, you had mentioned in the betrayal of the mentors that in some sense they're abdicating their authority, right? They're resigned to this flipping of the classroom. They kind of, you know, it's a, in some sense, it's a popular vote, right? I mean, you right. talked earlier about, you know, standardization, right, of testing and reading proficiencies. In the same way, faculty are also, um, part of that, pro, you know, that program. So if this is the case, you know, and especially in your book, Literary Theory and Autopsy, you talk a little bit about, a lot actually, um, about academic jargon, how useless kind of it becomes. In some sense, 
is the betrayal of the mentors in some sense also extending into the realm of scholarship, into kind of borrowing terms without knowing its roots, right? Um, um, are they contributing anything, right? I mean, if the people who were born in the 60s and are now professors and CEOs, now they're in charge, is the work now reflecting that for scholars? You, you know, this is, this is a, I hadn't thought of this, and, and, but, but this is a curious, uh, a curious you know, bifurcation where in the humanities we see much more of a concern for social issues, right, for social justice. It's now part of the discipline to talk about, to learn about identity uh, issues of all kinds. At the same time, the scholarship that humanities professors produce is completely without any public audience, without any social, social impact. I and mean, if you go to the library and you, and you get a, a, an issue of critical inquiry, uh, for instance, the language is, is entirely, uh, and the argument and the allusions and the references are simply inaccessible to an interested public reader. This didn't used to be the case. Lionel Trilling wrote one of the most important works of literary criticism and literary theory uh, called the, the Liberal Imagination. Uh, it appeared in 1950. It sold more than 100,000 copies, more than 100,000. Uh, a few years ago, a Yale Press editor told me that back in the 70s, every literary monograph that Yale published sold some 1,500 to 1,700 copies. Okay. Now, she said, maybe 250 it sells. And most of those, almost all of those, are standing library orders, right? Libraries order everything Yale publishes. So when you get individual purchasers, you're talking in the low two figures, you know, 20 or 30 people buy it. So at the same time that, you know, the, the, the humanities teachers very, very involved, in, you know, interested in politics, social issues, their work is utterly disconnected from that. And that's a function of over-specialization, right? That is also a function of the fact that when you're writing a book on Emily Dickinson's poetry, uh, in 1960, there were only about a dozen books already published on Emily Dickinson. And they tended to be biographical, uh, some, some historical, contextual, bibliographical, because her, her corpus, it wasn't easy to put it together. Uh, so they were 12, so the 13th book is going to try to cover, you know, a lot of crucial, important themes that people, everyone, every interested reader could relate to. Emily Dickinson talking about death. Emily Dickinson talking about God. Everyone had read Emily Dickinson. Everyone, everyone knew her. When she died in 1886, she had only published about 20 poems in her lifetime. No one knew who she was. They published an edition of her works in 1890. It went through five editions in two years. By 1895, Emily Dickinson was about the most famous woman in America. Right? She was dead, but everyone was wondering, who is this? Who is she? And everyone knew the soul selects her own society, then shuts the door. Uh, everyone knew, because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. You know, these, these are just entered the, the lexicon uh, at this point. So if you wrote a book, you've written the 13th book about Emily Dickinson, and so you could do original, interesting work that would have a large readership, and you might sell 2,000 units of that scholarly book. Well, now we've had about 1,800 books published on Emily Dickinson, all or in part, about 1,800 and a few thousand, several thousand articles. Now, in order to survive in academia, in order to publish and get tenure and promoted, you have to publish original work, original scholarship, which means you can't say anything that those 1,800 people have already said. So you are going to find some hyper-specialized or super theoretical or very, very avant-garde uh, theses to push about Emily Dickinson, hardly anybody is going to find that compelling or even, even, even readable right. as well. It gets you promoted, right? You, get, you do get published and, and you do get advanced, but 
it's just a professional exercise. It's not, it has no public impact at all. So why don't we turn it over to the audience and see if we have any yes, questions yes. From, uh, from folks who are, who've been watching to this point. Uh, we have a couple of microphones yeah. over here. If maybe we might get a student or two to handle one of them. Maybe I think our students have all disappeared. Maybe I can do Oh, very good. Thank you. Yeah, just go out to anybody. Let's, let's see if there are any questions first. Any questions for Professor Bauerlein? Maybe um, not a question as much as a personal, personal view of growing up in the 1960s, where I was um, grew up in New York City in the Bronx and. Uh, um, all of a sudden there were quote unquote hippies. And um, my friends who I'd grown up with, and we were all the same, and all of a sudden they split and they were a group that started doing, you know, pot. And then there were the geeks like myself who uh, lived on the straight and narrow, haha. -ha. But I remember the thing that to this day, and I repeat this to people, about the division in um, the society, in, in, in the teenage society, was there was a group, the, 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 the hippies decided to be different. They all dressed exactly alike. <laughs> That's the, the herd of independent minds, right? Yeah, I mean, even my friends who we walk around all different clothes, you know, because this is what we threw on, they'd wear pea coats, maroon scarves, combat boots, and jeans. And they'd hang out in a certain place, in, in, you know, in our neighborhood, and my friends and I would walk by and laugh that they were the individuals. The hippie uniform. Yeah, hippie, the hippie that uniform. Hippie right, the hippie um, but um, I think one, one of the points that, that you made that I've always thought about is that uh, my generation, having children, growing up in the very, in a uh, kind of like a break in time in America, we're the ones who have generated our culture of today. We have the kids of the 60s drop the history of, of our country, of our families. I knew, I knew my, uh, my mom and dads, I knew their, their social history, what America, what New York was like when they grew up. And I know now that my niece, Yale graduate, 44 years old, she doesn't have that. She doesn't know Everything started like when she got out of college, and that was it. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you're seeing in society? You know, I, I hadn't thought of that, but I think you're right. I think you're right. I mean, I, I, I may have, I, I can give you my own example. I mean, my father would, would sit us at the table, and he would talk about his family, talk about Kansas, I mean, at length, and boy, oh, God. <laughs> Uh, my brother and I would just, you know, please let us let us go. I don't do that with my son. You know, my 13-year-old son. I don't talk about my my own past. I'm not even sure why. Well, it, best if he doesn't know, uh, you know, a, a lot of a lot of his family history. But and it's probably I, too busy with his social uh, media. Yeah, well, it's right. Fortnite. It's Fortnite. Yeah, oh, brother. <laughs> you know, I mean, he's he's hooked. It's actually a kind of cool game, but uh, it's too much time. He spends too much time on it. Um, just basically, why would you feel that there are parts of your family history that you're, or are you just, you know, throwing off a comment? Well, it, it wouldn't make him feel good, actually, um, to, oh, to know about so my family many, history. So many things, like, I, I found out that my, my grandparents, whom I, whom I never knew, my father's parents, they made bathtub gin during the Depression. They what? They made bathtub gin. They made bathtub yeah, gin. I, I now, mean, my son know, would so think that's pretty cool. That's a fun yeah, well, story, that, actually. But I, you know, but there, there are things that... Other people may not think or really, but it's part of my, my heritage. It's yeah. part of my, and, and I want to know that side. These things would be, would be embarrassing, but, but uh, <laughs> if, 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 he, if he heard. But, um, you know, I think there's more mobility. 
People move around more. Uh, kids go to college more, far away from where they, from where they grew up. Uh, I mean, my sister, we were living in Maryland when my sister uh, graduated from high school. She went to the University of Maryland. When my brother and I graduated from high school, we, we were in Southern California, we went to UCLA. So we, we stayed you know, near, nearby, and, but, but now people, people just spread out and, and so we don't have the, uh, really the, the, the location, right? uh, the, the grounding in, in, in one place. I, I'm trying to think of, of, I mean all my academic friends, for instance, all my colleagues, they, they grew up in different places than Atlanta, you know, where, where, at Emory University where I am. None of them are, are, are from Georgia. Um, uh, all, all the teachers, they, they, they came from somewhere else. My students, I would say less than 10% of them are from Georgia. Now a lot of them are gonna stay in Atlanta, a lot of them stay in Atlanta after they graduate. Atlanta is a growing place, a lot of jobs in Atlanta. But that means they're, they're not going back to work in a family business, they're, they're not even, they're not going back to the home. And, and I think that breaks up, you know, the, the tradition, family tradition uh, as, as well. Are there other questions? I see one, I see a couple. Uh, I think a very interesting topic. Um, do you think we've done a good job we have an average age in Congress of old white men until recently, and we budgeted schools and cut that. We've gone had wars, which has continued. So if you're 30 years old, 35 years old today, how well have we done? And what do you think? So if there's this disjointing, we have a significant responsibility beyond the technology. Because I don't know if we're being seen as having done such a very good job. When, when you say we, you mean our generation? Correct. And the kids now are 35 years old. I guess we're talking about some of those 30s. I think we've done a terrible job. OK. So, <laughs> so That's with, what I've been saying. Without yeah. the technology, there's reason for these folks that are younger to not listen, not be, to be disinterested, not necessarily related to technology. They have the, no, they have the ability, they have the brights. But look what we've done. So there is some independent thinking going on. That's, that's my take. Well, I, I, I would say that, that I mean, it's, it's uh, there's no reason for them not to, to know more history. I mean, to make a judgment about the present, you, it's always relative, right? You need to compare the present against the past. You need to understand. I mean, if you want to understand race relations today, you've got to understand race relations 100 years ago, right? In, in this country, you know, before the civil rights era, during the progressive era, this is, this is uh, uh, something that will inform their, their judgment of, of the world that we're in. I think our greatest failing on that score is that we have not impressed upon younger people the necessity of having the cultural literacy to become more discerning consumers so that when they hear a political speech today, they've got models of oratory from Booker T. Washington, from Martin Luther King, from Daniel Webster, from Abraham Lincoln, that tradition is, is, is a ground for taking all the chaos of the present and filtering it out and, 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 and trying to discern what what is wrong with it. And, and, and I think that, that uh, we, we didn't present 
tradition as this is going to give your individuality more strength, right? This is going to make you, as a person, uh, a, a deeper, a deeper, independent thinker. So, but if you have, we didn't have the we we didn't have the textbooks in parts of the country. We cut these programs where we chose to select the reading lists. So we need to do better. And this generation um, needs to, the next coming up needs to do better. And, but it's awful difficult when they, difficult for them, I think to a degree, not that difficult. They have to cut their own path because the path we made and isn't pretty. Yeah. Maybe pretty is not the right word. And you can look at history. Well, well okay, here's what I would ask. Um, you, you say, you know, cut your own path. Yes. I do not think that the immersion in social media is helping them to do that. Right? I think social media generally is, a, is, is, a, is an instrument more of conformity than, than independent, uh, independent thinking. I think it's for teenagers especially, it is a powerful tool of peer pressure. Very strong peer pressure is, is funneled through, uh, through the social media and that Read Emerson, right? There was another question over on the other side of the aisle. There you go. So in the 1960s, a lot of religious institutions were drastically changing their form of operations. You had the rise of, in the Catholic Church at least, the change in things like Vatican II. Uh, Protestants were changing their, uh, their means of operating. How do you think the role, the role of religious institutions have changed due to the 1960s? Or were they a part of the mechanism of the change force in the 1960s? I, I, I have to make a, a confession. You know, I was, I was baptized a Catholic. My brother and I were baptized Catholics. I'm, I'm a twin, so I always you know, think, think too. But uh, I was baptized a Catholic. My parents were both Catholics, but they, in their separate ways, got caught up in the 60s, and, and so we didn't really have any religious education, never made it our first communion. And when I was, you know, 17, I had this conversion experience that happened one morning, and I, you know, sort of looked around and, and was a just, so, you know, instantly a, a militant, uh, secular, atheist, uh, you know, hardcore nihilist, and it, it it sunk deep, and and so you know, I spent all my time. I didn't I didn't work in school. I spent all my time reading Nietzsche, and and you know, Freud on religion, and, and Marx on on religion. So I I, I had no religious uh, training, no religious experience, no religious schooling, as well. And I mean, this this is a case of 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 secularization in, in education. I got a PhD in English at UCLA, um, finished at the end of the 80s, and did 19th century American literature was roughly my, my field. Uh, but they, you say they made you study a lot, very broad, broad range of things. And the most important book in American cultural history, if not American history, is obviously the Bible. King James never came up in, in my classes, my American literature classes. King James is everywhere in Melville, it's in Whitman. The Psalms are, are, are everywhere. And uh, the Sermon on the Mount, goodness. Um, Barack Obama quotes from, quotes from the New Testament in his, in his inauguration, uh, put away childish things. Uh, our, you know, Ronald Reagan does, JFK uh, quote, quotes um, from the Sermon on the Mount. And I didn't get anything. I, oh, about 10, 12 years ago, I, I sort of, 
try to leave my atheism behind. And a couple of years ago, I ended up coming back into the Catholic Church, and I work for a religious magazine. Uh, but my, my knowledge, I don't have the knowledge to, to, to help you with that question. I'm sorry. Um, I'm, I'm just, uh, it's a big gap for me to talk about the religious institutions. But I hear a lot of talk at the magazine uh, about it. I'm in constant talk about Vatican II and especially about the, scan you know, the, the new set of scandals that have come out and that really um, go, go back quite a long time. And the Catholic leadership right now doesn't seem to be recognizing just how angry the people in the pews are and just what a, what a crisis this is for, for the church. Um, to me, we're, what we're getting here is managerial responses spoken in bureaucraties kinds of language out of the Vatican and the, and the cardinals. And it's not gonna, I don't think it's gonna work. Um, but if you, I, do you wanna, <laughs> do you wanna, do you wanna oh, elaborate or? Sure, I mean, what I was trying to, what I was trying to angle at was more talking about, uh, on the local level, you're talking, you're, you're speaking about when reference to universities about how that breaks down that sense of individual community structure and for most of human history, and especially American history, churches and religious institutions, regardless of uh, Catholic or Protestant, have provided this That's fundamental right. structure to these communities. And right. with that breakdown, what do you think that effect has been? I, 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 I okay, right, right. And, and churches were, were, were centers of, of, of everything in, in communities in America. I mean, the, you know, you know before, the revolution, before the Constitution was signed and the debates leading up to the Constitution, uh, in political tracts that were published at that time, the most commonly cited work was not Montesquieu, it was not John Locke, it was Leviticus, where you have the fullest articulation of the Ten Commandments. Now, a lot of those people, point when they did this survey, people pointed out, well, wait, you're talking about sermons here. Well, that's the whole point. Sermons, the, the, the distinction between a sermon and a political tract in colonial America was actually very fuzzy. That, that, that's how important the church was. In, I did a book about, uh, several years ago, I did a book about the Atlanta race riot in 1906. And so I went back to the newspapers. I, I tried to do a, 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 an hour by hour account of this four day race riot. And I'd go through the newspapers every Sunday on the editorial page was a report about the sermons given in all the churches describing the content of those sermons. The city council would constantly have ministers and priests from the white and the black churches coming in to address the city council to advise them on political and civic issues and also to inform them what's going on, uh, what the people want, want to see. So, the churches were at the center of political life and, and civic life back then in a way that, you know, the phrase separation of church and state makes no sense. It just doesn't apply uh, to, to most of American history. We discovered that in the 20th century and, and suddenly it became an, a lot like that, that phrase in Jefferson's letter uh, assumed the status of, of a founding document now, separation of church and state. But, Again, that, that wouldn't have made sense to anyone in America in 19, you know, 1890. So uh, the church was, yeah, religious, it was political, it was a social glue, it was familial, and it was, yeah, it was, it was the core. Well, you know, church, church going has, has dropped in the last 50 years significantly. The rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, uh, has, has, you know, getting close to 20%. Right. Uh, of nuns at, at this point. And so that means precisely a loss of a core, right? An institution that was a fundamental orientation for everyone living there is, is pretty much gone for, I would say, the, the majority of Americans at this point. 
And, and what replaces it? What is taken? Nothing. You know, I don't think anything has, has replaced uh, the, the church. And it's easy. You know, I did a panel. And, uh, and I moderated a panel on social media. And there were three people on the panel. And one of them ran a social media center at Georgetown. And he said that social media now in America is, according to their surveys, the greatest driver of charitable giving. There is nothing that is a stronger source of charitable giving than through social media. And I just, I just sort of said, in your survey, did you include regular church going and donation? No. Huh. That shows how the church has just dropped off the map. Even though the church is clearly the greatest driver of charitable giving every week. Millions and millions and millions of dollars go through churches into, into charitable organizations. Yeah, and if I may real quickly, too, I mean, there's no doubt in the literature, uh, if you look at this, as someone who's written a little bit on American religion and taught a course on it for a while, late 60s, early 70s, that's really the beginning of all the processes that you're talking about. They're the emergence of these things yeah. that in sociology we call new religious movements, which yeah. in the popular vernacular they call cults, cult movements, the you know, all right. these new fangled hybrid things Communes, that borrowed a little bit from different kinds. Eastern religions, and, and the, the tendency toward something that the American sociologist Bob Bella called Sheilaism, by which he meant a kind of individualist spirituality that, that pulled people away from collective forms of worship and into their own idiosyncratic you know, I'm going to put together my own, he, he, he gets the term Sheilaism because he's, talk, he's talking about one of his subjects who's named Sheila, who describes her religion as Sheilaism. It's my own little religion. I took some pieces of that, and I took some pieces of that, and some pieces of that, and I put it together, and that's my religion. And then Bella asks her, so what does your religion consist of in terms of ritual and so forth? And she goes, ritual? There's no collective life. It's me. So it's some ideas that I have and some things that I do. We talked a little bit about this yeah, earlier today. Yeah. We were, this, in a lot of sociological language, once religion isn't collective anymore, it's really not religion. It's something else. I mean, even folks who do this have their own language to talk about. They, they say they're spiritual rather than religious. And, and, and another thing, when I mentioned the nuns, N-U-N-S, in a 10 or 15 year period, the nuns disappeared. Right. Effectively, they disappeared. In, in, in the early 20th century, millions of kids in America were taught by nuns. Okay? And they had a ruler in their hand, right? My mother will, 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 will talk about, about how cruel the nuns were. But millions of school children were, were educated by nuns. 19, 1975, they're gone. Okay? In just a very short period after Vatican II, the sexual revolution was a big part of this. Gone. Yeah. There is a slight, a slight comeback that we see. Devotions. Do we have other questions? Hi, I have a question regarding the portion of your discussion where you talked about the silent language, the hand motions, the facial expressions, the body space, and the way you said that you will make your students come into office hours with you and observe if they have, they have these skills. My question for you is, if someone does not have these skills, what do you prescribe as a remediation for that? <laughs> Very simple, <laughs> practice, right? Do it, just, just do it and, and acquire it. I will tell students that when, when you come into my office, you're practicing. One, you're doing something unusual for many of you, and that is to sit across the table from someone 30 years older than yourself and talk, sometimes about things that drift far off the syllabus. Hmm someone who is not part of your social world, who has no interest in your social world. I mean, no common interests, right? You're, I, I don't do your music, I don't do your friends. We're supposed to, but we have to talk about something independent of your personal social condition, intellectual things, political things, current events. You're practicing with me right now. And you need to do this over and over again in your other classes as well. So that when you go out there for that job interview and you, you, you get invited to lunch and you're at the, at the lunch table with three people who are 30 years older than yourself, you're, you're comfortable. 
You have things to talk about. You, you have experience. One of the things the internet, social media has done is something called age segregation. Uh, that social scientists talk about this actually 50 years ago. Age segregation. What does age segregation do? It allows 17 year olds to relate to 17 year olds. Right? You don't go out and play with the neighborhood kids who are of varying ages. Right? You know, group, you know, little kid, little little brothers and sisters, you know, rage. No, you I don't want to talk. I'm 17. You know, you know how far a 14-year-old is from a 17-year-old, right? A whole other universe. You you now on the internet, online, you can relate to people horizontally. I go into my room and I shut the door, right? Because I don't want to talk to my stupid parents and I don't want to have to deal with, you know, when I when I was 15, I don't want to sit here and listen to them rant about Richard Nixon and, and whatever, but I, I didn't have anywhere else to go. Right? So I had to sort of, and the TV, there was only five channels on the TV. And there were no programs that had my age group in them. There were programs I liked, but they didn't have teenagers in them. I went, I, I, I mean, Gilligan's Island had no teenagers. Uh, Get Smart, no teenagers. Twilight Zone, no teenagers. And I went back just as an experiment uh, a while ago and looked at Atlanta TV in 1970. I looked at an old TV guy. And I went through the whole day's shows. First of all, there were only five channels, hmm. right? ABC, you know, the networks, and then a PBS, which had just started, and then some local showing cartoons. And, 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 so, and, and I looked in the afternoon and evening and there was nothing, there, there was only one show that had a teenager in it. It was the Patty Duke show. Uh, some of you remember the Patty Duke show. There were other shows that kids would like, but they didn't have teenagers uh, in them. Ozzie and Harry. Oh yeah, you had uh, Ricky Nelson. That's right, that's right, in, in, in the late, uh, what, late 50s? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so th there, were, there were a couple, but you know, we, but, but by 1985, tons of shows with teenagers in them. It's Saved by the Bell, uh, th these things. And um, that, that, that enhances the age segregation process. The, the idea that I don't have to relate to people or even watch shows with people who are, and take, ser take seriously, you know, people who are 50 years old. That's one of the things that the internet has aggravated, that, that, that process of relating so horizontally. So when they come into my office, part of it is just, I'm different from you, all right? I have a totally different socialization. I have a totally different experience. What are we gonna talk about here? We'll talk about some literature on the syllabus, but things are gonna spread out, all right? That's what happens with, with, the, with literary discussions. And we've gotta got relate beyond your, your personal social life, and that's good practice for, for them. So the, the remediation is just do it. Just do it, and you, and you get better. I'm one of, that's one of the things in, in public speaking. You get better. I mean, the first, the first lectures I gave were awful, right? The first interviews were, were, were terrible. You just after, you, after you've done 50 of them, you know, it just gets, gets easier. So I, I would say to the undergraduates here, go talk to your professors. Just go in their offices and talk with them as part of your formation, right? Part, part of your preparing yourself for, you know, the, the world. Any more questions? Do you think that, I guess, the lack, or I guess the problem of less of a dialogue or just engagement in dialectical method of discussing conflicts of ideas, especially among young people today, is a result more of social media or as you were talking about uh, the growth of young people because of the older generations, their parents and grandparents not instilling with them as much of these types of discussions? Pro probably, I'm sure, I'm sure it's both. I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of factors come, a lot like that, come, come into play. I mean, one of the things th th that I would ask, do, uh, I mean, this is one of the big complaints today, that social media builds echo chambers, right? 
you can, you can create what, what uh, Cass Sunstein called the daily me, right? Where you simply groove your, your inputs to things that are comforting, that reinforce your, your point of view, that reflect your experience of things. So on Twitter, what if you don't like the, the tweets that this person is doing, you just get rid of them, right? You, you, you can filter now in a way you couldn't before when there were only three news networks to choose from. Walter Cronkite, you know, then, then, then you, could, you, you had to take in whatever, whatever you're getting from, from that news source. Um, and they didn't He kept it, he kept it pretty, he played it pretty, pretty muted. That, that's right. Um, and now, all these different sites, these news sources, they're, they're building niche audiences right, for, for themselves. So, so you, 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 you have a proliferation of media that are more, um, more characterized, right? They have, more, they have more of a partisan, a partisan take on, on things. I don't mind that as long as it's not, it's, it's not monopolizing. You know, one source isn't monopolizing people's, people's attention. I mean, I, I, I have to take a look at the New York Times editorial page. I don't, I don't like most of what I read there, but you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be exposed uh, to that. Um, so, uh, this, this though is, is one problem with the social media. Environment. I mean, who wants? To, it's not pleasant to hear things that contradict your outlook. It's no fun, and it's nice to get reinforcement. It's nice to feel like people are echoing your own your own experiences, especially if you if you're keyed up about them. So it's hard. And the idea that, uh, that you can rise above partisanship and tribalism. I mean, a lot of social scientists will call this a miracle, hmm. right? The miracle of, of liberal freedoms, the miracle of liberalism, that we can have a plurality of, of political points of view, that we can have a plurality of religions, you know, that we can have votes where people, where people uh, you know, instead of going to war, they, 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 go to, uh, they go to civic war, right? Peaceful and work it out through democratic processes. That's, that's not the, that's not been the rule of, of human civilizations. Other questions? Okay. Can't believe we're not gonna get a, a single student who wants to push back against the dumbest generation argument. Is Defend yourselves, for crying out loud. <laughs> up, so, up here. Yeah. Um, a distinction that I've, I've heard people make is between the freedom from and the freedom to. And it seems like that really fits an awful lot of what we've been talking about. You get the freedom to create better art if you uh, don't uh, take the freedom from having to study uh, the great artists. And I was wondering if you have any comments that might, if you would agree that that's a, a useful distinction. Yeah, I think, you know, sometimes they call it positive freedom and negative freedom, right? Negative freedom means I don't have anything constraining me. I can do what I want. You know, I'm left alone, right? The libertarian idea of, of negative freedom. Positive freedom is, you know, the, the, the idea that you can commit to something, right? Something bigger that we can form, form coalitions and try to create something positive. And, and it's always going to be, again, uh, there's going to be a little conflict there because positive freedom is going to run up against negative freedom when people form coalitions, right? They form an interest group. Well, that's going to set up some competition with other interest groups. I mean, you, you, can't, you, you can't set up an interest group that isn't going to, that isn't going to draw resources 
right, from for poli political political power from from other groups. But uh, you know, you try to you try to limit that positive freedom enough so that it doesn't right infringe too much on on others uh, when it succeeds. Uh, but you don't want to limit it so much that it keeps people from, from forming interest groups, from forming partisan, partisan bodies, from, from espousing something. And so, you know, the, I, th I think the 60s was a, a, a real, a, you, you got a real mix of those two things. In, in, in one sense, it was we're loosening all the old regulations, a lot of the norms. On, on sex and drugs and, and, uh, and public, you know, public habits, you know, clothing, lifestyles. We're gonna let all that, let all that go, do your own thing, right? Uh, whatever floats your boat. Uh, but then on the other hand, there was the positive freedom of like people going off in, into communes, right? The creation of communes, people joining together to form their own little, uh, little, little communities. People, uh, people getting on the bus, you know, with Ken Kesey, and riding across the country, and, and, and uh, very, this very communal, uh, communal kind of expression, right? And telling the whole world, this is us, you know. Uh, so I think that the '60s, we sort of had extreme versions of of both of, of both of those. I mean, idiosyncratic forms of positive freedom uh, at the same time that you had a, a tremendous rise. In, in, negative, in negative freedom that had to do with things like the invention of the pill and no fault, the advent of no-fault divorce, right? the sexual revolution, women's liberation, and the, the startup you know, the, 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 a few years into the 70s of, of, uh, of gay pride right? coming, coming along. So, and not, not to mention the civil rights movement, which I don't see as a 60s phenomenon. And the civil rights movement really, I mean, officially, sometimes officially, it's put at the beginning of Harry Truman's administration. When Harry Truman went to meet with the leaders of the NAACP, it was in 47 or 48 on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, right? Which is a very, that's why it's a symbol, the Lincoln Memorial is a symbolic site of civil rights, right? You got Lincoln in there, Truman meeting with them on the steps, and then the 1963. King and Du Bois and, and others there. Um, but the civil rights movement really I see as a 1950s phenomenon uh, more, than, more than 1960s. Uh, we got the Civil Rights Act in 64 and the Voting Rights Act in 65, but really it was, most of the work was done before, before, before JFK. Probably should think about closing up shop. Yeah. Um, Again, thank you very much for coming, and we look forward books. to seeing some books. Oh uh, yes, I should say a quick word. Uh, there are some some of Professor Bowerling's books are at the back. They are a number of different titles. Paperbacks are going at the five dollars each. I sell I sell books Club titles my own, for ten bucks less than my own cost. There you go. So uh, do take a look yeah, back there if you're if you're at all interested. Yeah. And thanks very much again. We look forward to seeing some of you maybe at some of the other events. Stay warm out there. Thank you.